assembly and arithmetic. If you blind yourself to the fact that your opinion is entirely wrong, you're essentially right. I bludgeoned the slumbering Kunagisa awake, forced her to wash her face, and tied her hair into pigtails for her. Then, with her still half asleep, and me half carrying her, we headed to the dining hall, where everyone else from the mansion was already gathered. Round table. Two empty seats. I helped Kunagisa to her seat, and then sat down next to her. As I settled in my chair, I took a quick look around the table at each person. Out of the twelve people present, the most eye-catching person, and I'm not sure whether or not this goes without saying, was none other than the mistress of the house, Akagami Iriasan. The concept of beauty is wholly subjective, varying from one person to the next, so to say that Iriasan was beautiful will probably be pointless. If I say she was beautiful, then that was simply something that I personally felt, and nothing more. Besides, Akarisan the maid was way more up my alley, as long as we're talking about personal preferences. Uh, but none of that matters. Seriously. To give something more objective, Akagami Iria was a classy woman. She wore her pretty black hair in a roll, coupled with an expensive looking dress. She was actually somewhat mismatched, but her excessive classiness more than made up for it. She seemed to be around the same age as me, still in her twenties. But man, upbringing and lineage really do have their effects on people. Of course, there's always been other factors as well. Of course, there's always been other factors as well, but those things are important for sure. That's always been the case. Akagami Iria, the black sheep granddaughter of the Akagami Foundation. Well then, now that Kunigisa-san is here, shall we commence with the best part of the day? She put her hands together like a little kid. Chow down. It seemed that she was fairly immature emotionally. It was probably safe to say that she wasn't the most worldly person out there, but it was probably just as well to her. Incidentally, this island, where people were largely free to do as they wish, had a single rule. We all eat dinner together. It was a simple rule that shouldn't have been hard for anyone to follow, but indeed, quite a few so-called geniuses had failed to do so and ended up leaving the island. There are a lot of similarities between a genius and a person with no common sense or decency. Iria-san sat with two maids either side of her. On her left was Teruko-san and Re-san. On her right, Akari-san and Hikari-san. There was no way to distinguish between Akari-san and Hikari-san, so I couldn't tell which one was which. Theoretically, one would have been able to tell them apart by their facial expressions and gestures and such. But for the non-observant type like myself, it was a challenge. Kunigisa seemed to be able to distinguish between the two, which was no mystery since it was Kunigisa after all. But depending on the conversation, she seemed to have trouble distinguishing who was Iriasan. Nobody seemed to mind. Now then, everyone raise your glasses. Cheers! She said, she said, almost as if singing. Her glass raised high in the air, everyone else, including myself, did likewise. But it bore mentioning that my glass and Kunigisa's glass were filled not with wine, but with juice. After all, we were underage. A number of dishes were set beautifully around the table. They were the proud masterpieces of the chef extraordinaire Shasharina Yoyoi. I'll start with the dish closest to me and then go in that order. Crowned lamb roast. Cappuccino based sweet potato soup, foie gras terrine with truffle gnocchi, steam blue mussels, Belgian eel simmered in green sauce, pickled herring, well meat sashimi, sauce covered ravioli, ostrich meat carpaccio, fruit salad, potato salad with egg, and finally, oil sauteed mushrooms. Yup, I was clueless. Probably because Yuyoi-san had created each dish specifically to cater to the respective taste of each guest. Even after hearing the names, I had no idea what I was eating. It's not like the name has any profound influence on any- It's not like the name has a profound influence on the thing itself, I think. After all this, there was said to be dessert as well. If you thought about it, it was a really copious quantity of food. And with Yuyoi being the culinary maestro she was, the food was so delicious that I all but entirely neglected to watch my wit. Granted, yoyoi san had apparently factored that into her cooking. After factoring some nutritional value, still amazing. She really is a genius, I muttered to myself more than a couple of times. Speaking of which, I had spoken to yoyoi san a bit during lunch. When I had gone to the dining hall, she happened to be the only person around, so I used the opportunity to inquire about the most popular rumours about her. In other words, what the secret power that allowed her to make any dish better than any other chef. 
That was the question. Upon hearing it, Yoyoi-san gave me a curious smirk. I'm afraid reality doesn't live up to the legends. Unlike Himena-san, I don't have any sort of wild superpowers. Basically, it's just effort and discipline. Really? Well, I suppose I can imagine what might have started the rumour. My senses of taste and smell are a little, well, a lot stronger than the average person's. She flicked out her tongue. To give an anecdotal example, uh, okay, like Helen Keller. She was blind, but they say she could distinguish between people just by their smell. I'm a little bit like that. My sense of smell isn't quite that amazing, but for example, she took my arm and without warning, licked the palm of my hand. I never would have dreamed things would have ended up like this, and I nearly let out a yelp, though somehow I managed to suppress it. With her tongue still out, she gave an Einsteinish grin. You've got type AB blood, don't you? She said. Negative, right? Being so told, it occurred to me that she was right. A public health doctor once told me, you have extremely rare blood type. So your yo san was right for sure. But you can really tell just by licking my skin? Well, by licking your sweat, to be specific. My tongue could distinguish between approximately 20,000 flavours, dividing them into 20 levels of intensity. My sense of smell is probably about half that good, I suppose. She tilted her head thoughtfully. It was a cute mannerism. I'm not smart like Sonoyama-san. I'm terrible at art, unlike Ibuki-san. I'm not particularly skilled with machines like Kunigisa-san. I certainly don't have any special powers like Himena-san, and it's not much else I'm good at. But I've had this one strong gift since I was a child. I figured becoming a chef was the only way to take advantage of it. Perfect taste, they call it. It's the taste version of perfect pitch. Except, perfect taste isn't something you can acquire with training. In other words, Sashirono Yuyoi-san was, to come out and say it, one of the lucky few chosen by God. Among the highly skilled, there were two types of people. Those who were chosen, and those who choose themselves. Those who were born with it, and those who work for it. Of course... Yoyoi-san had discipline and effort, but she was evidently the former type. So the path of the chef wasn't really something she had chosen. She had been born with a gift, and for that reason, had gone to study gastronomy, travel to the West, and polish her inborn talents even further. The idea of flavour ultimately stems from each individual's ability to judge taste, how well a person can utilise and take advantage of flavour as if it was their own possession. That was largely connected to one skill as a cook and well reflected in yoyoi sans own cooking. Well, that's the chopped logic of it, but it doesn't mean much practically. To put it in a better way, yoyoi san cooking was damn good. If you thought of the round table as a clock, with iria san sitting at 12 o'clock, then Sashirori yoyoi san was at 3 o'clock next to terika san in rei san. At 4 o'clock was Sakaki shinya san As you would expect from a man who had been long employed as Kanami's caretaker, he looked not the least bit intimidated, and was actually rather stately looking. Next to him was Ibuki Kanami-san, at the 5 o'clock position. Behind her was a wheelchair, which she likely had used to come to the dining room. She didn't seem to be in a particularly bad mood, but she didn't look very cheerful either. At 6 o'clock was Kunigisa. This meant that she was sitting directly across from the mistress of the house, Akagami Iriya-san. That was more than enough to make me nervous, but really, that didn't matter. To Kunigisa, the word nervous didn't even exist in the Japanese language. Then, the lucky seat. Number 7, sat myself. Next to me at 8 o'clock sat Sonoyama Akane-san of the Seven Fools. She was completely immersed in devouring Yoyoi-san's cuisine. She had much more of an appetite than you might expect. Of course, she was a human being before she was a scholar, whether or not she would admit it herself. And you can't live if you don't eat. But even if you disregarded that, she was a serious eater. Even I felt satisfied just watching her eat. It seemed to me that Yoyoi-san must have been really proud to see her devouring her food so delightly. Next to Akane-san, at 9 o'clock sat fortune-telling master, the one with ESP superpowers, Himena Maki-san. At the same point, she had apparently changed her clothes, and was now adorned in an entirely different fashion than this morning. She wore a halter-neck striped shirt with a pale pink cardigan and sheep-printed crop pants. Her hair was up in two ponytails, possibly because she noticed me looking at her. She looked back at me with a strangely unpleasant sneer and sank her teeth into some roast lamb. It was an expression that said, I know everything, but I'm not saying anything. And it made me wholly uncomfortable. It never ends. At 10 and 11 o'clock was Akari-san and Hikari-san. 
Teriko-san was completely silent and mostly expressionless. She just placed food in her mouth like it was some mechanical process. For someone to be able to eat food without any sort of reaction, it made you wonder if she had any sense of taste. In the face of the three sisters' air of youthfulness, Rei-san, in contrast, had the look of a mature, uptight career woman. I hadn't heard her talk much, but judging from her appearance, she seemed to be the strict type, and I heard the corroborating sob stories of Hikari-san several times by now. So there you have it. That's all 12 people. Lucky number? With a face like this? Just babbling again. What kind of meaning lay in, what kind of meaning lay in things like that? I was very obviously standing out here. You could even call me the black sheep. Then again, there had never been a place where I didn't stand out. Not Kobe, not Houston, not Kyoto, and not even this island. In this wild world, there's only one me. Yeah, whatever. I like loneliness. No bluff. Even if I was bluffing. Oh, by the way, if I can change the subject, Iria-san said, bringing the individual conversations that had been developing up until now to an immediate halt. The power to direct the table conversation lay in Iria-san's hands alone. It was a selfish privilege befitting to an upper-class girl. She continued, raising her voice. It seems that there are rumours floating around, so I'll go ahead and make an announcement. This is about the next guest, the latest genius to grace this house. All eyes were on Iria-san. Well, all except Kunagisa, who continued to chow down on the whale meat. To deliberately try and capture that girl's attention was quite a difficult task. I'd like to emphasize that our new guest is a possessor of such extraordinarily glorious talent that it even bears comparison to you all. I'd like very much for you to welcome this person, so please cooperate, okay? Each person gave a personalized reaction. The part about bearing comparison to everyone seemed to really shake things up, with everyone seemingly restraining themselves. Only the very ordinary Shinya-san dared to speak up. Question. Just who is this person? I don't really know a whole lot just from rumors I've heard but they say that he's a real jack of all chairs. Is that right? You could say that. We've only met once before, but yeah, once is enough. This person is my hero. She gazed up, evidently deep in thought. A truly heroic existence to me. Like a detective in a mystery novel, or a monster in a monster movie. A monster? I could feel my eyebrows raise of their own accord. Iria Sana just dropped a reference to monster movies, but was that really an accurate description of this person? That wasn't the kind of vocabulary you typically use to describe a person. Even if you did, it definitely wasn't a compliment. That's quite a hard sell. Sounds like we can expect quite a bit from this individual, Shinya-san said, with a boisterous chuckle. I hear this person could do all sorts of things, such as paint wonderfully and so on. I've never seen it, but I wouldn't be surprised. I imagine something as simple as painting a picture shouldn't be a challenge. As you'd expect, this seemed to have wounded Kanami's pride. She looked a little bit by which I mean ridiculously miffed. Might we possibly be graced by knowing the name of this superior specimen, Iria-san, Kanami-san said. Her tone had a bite to it. I thought of this this morning as well, but Kanami-san really did have a lot of pride. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not strictly a good thing either. Far be it for me to cast dispersion about the way that Kanami-san chose to live. But to say the least, I knew that I could never live like that. Iria's expression suggested that she didn't understand why Kanami-san was so mad, and in reality that was probably the case. And she answered plainly, Aikawa-san. Pure dumbfoundedness. At this point, Kanami-san seemed like the stupid one. Owing to the extremely busy schedule, Aikawa-san will only be staying here for three days. But everyone, please be friendly. Aikawa-san is a big deal to me. You could even call it love. Iria-san's cheeks turned bright red, seeing that childish mannerism. Her audience was thrown even further into bewilderment. It felt like it felt like she could have made any demand. It felt like she could have made any demand, however bossy, and everyone would have forgiven it. She innately had that sort of air about her, probably her lineage to blame again. Even still, I cower? I'd never heard the name. Ignorant as I was, I looked over at Kunagisa to see her reaction, but she was still eating. When that girl is focused on something, she was always like that. More incorrigible than a child, and harder to handle than an animal. Well, then again, at least she knew how to sit in a chair. Oh, I'm so looking forward to it. Do you think Aikawa-san is coming again? I've asked many times. It's like a dream. Oh, what if it really was a dream? She said as if in a daze. Judging from her current state, Iria-san must have been pretty head of her heels for this Aikawa guy. 
It was like she was talking about a man that she'd been in love with for years and years. She spoke his name with great reverence. Ah, speaking of which, Kunigisa-san, she said, turning the conversation toward Kunigisa. You were going to leave before then, isn't that right? Hmm. Oh, yep, yep, she responded. She never stopped moving the chopsticks she held in her hands. The fact that she was holding a chopstick in each hand was enough to have a testament of her bad table manners. Yep, four more days. That's really too bad. It's going to be such a great opportunity. I'd like you to meet Aikawa-san. There's really no way. Afraid not. I'm from a world where you've planned to do something, you can't change it. They even call me the living timetable. Each and two, of course. Don't drag me into this, I thought. Coming to this island in the first place was never part of my timetable. Iria nodded with a truly disappointed look on her face. Is that so? Say, could it be that you're not having a good time here? It doesn't seem like you've left your room much. I'm from a world where people don't leave their room much. But no, I'm having fun. Lots of fun. I can even have fun anywhere, anytime, all the way. Her words made me stiffen a bit. There was no exaggeration in what she said. For someone who is completely immersed in their own world, there was never a time that isn't fun. And what of all other emotions? How tragic must it be to always have fun, no matter where you are? That was something I already knew the answer to. Ah, is that so? Iria shrugged. But Kunigisa, surely even you would find value in meeting Aikawa-san. Meeting a person like that. You're bound to find some inspiration. As if she'd been waiting for the perfect timing, Kanami-san broke into the conversation. Being influenced by another person is proof of one's mediocrity. Of one's impotence. How ridiculous. I don't know what kind of person this Aikawa is, but I sincerely doubt there's any need to meet him. Now, now, is that a fact? Playing devil's advocate with Kanami-san was the obvious choice of Sonoyama Akane. I spent several years surrounded by the finest minds in the world, and I know for a fact that if I hadn't had that experience, I wouldn't be where I am today. You can better yourself just by spending time with brilliant people. The ER3, what a joke. You must be stupid. Why would anyone ever want to bind themselves to such an organisation? Kanami sneered. I don't consider that I'm binding myself. Everyone is free to move around as they please, and help hone one another's skills. Free? Don't just throw that word around. An organisation with no restrictions isn't an organisation at all. In the end, even you were just a member of a hierarchy, isn't that right? What a crock. I've been here on this island with you for a while now, but I certainly don't feel like I've become any more refined. If anything, my worth is decreasing. They glared at each other. To act this way in front of a whole group of people. They really were childish. I was a little bit appalled. The maids tried their best to mediate, but Iriasan had a look of pure delight on her face as she watched the dueling pair, so they restrained from stepping in. This kind of situation wasn't really my cup of tea. Meanwhile, Yoyoi-san looked fairly indifferent as well, while Maki-san looked entirely unimpressed, and Shinya-san seemed to have written the whole dispute off as an everyday occurrence. It was amazing that not a single person there could stop them. Ah, wait... There was someone. Just one person. After all, Ibuki-san, humans are colonial species. People such as yourselves who act like bums and expect special treatment all ought to rethink their lifestyle, if you ask me, I said. I suppose that means that you can't function without being surrounded by other people. People aren't migratory fish, you know, and I don't expect special treatment. I just don't put myself down. I live honestly and assess things as they really are. Kanami snapped. Hmm, I wonder. Hmm, I wonder. Ah, more vague questions. You think that you look clever by taking an ambiguous stance without ever clearly stating your opinion? Yeah, real clever. I wonder, Kanami said. This is a little hard to listen to. A voice. It was Kunigisa. She powered her lips like a sulky kid and looked at Kanami-san. This is hurting my ears. Kanami-chan, Akane-chan. In an instant... She had drawn everyone's attention. Nobody had expected Kunigisa of all people to say that. I had had quite a few experience with Kunigisa in the past, so it wasn't beyond imaginable. Kunigisa Tomo hated watching people fight quite a bit. Considering her usual happy-go-lucky attitude, it may have been a little unexpected, but it did make some sense. She was a fun-loving girl, which meant she didn't like situations that weren't fun. The logic was simple as that. I'm sorry, I went too far. Somewhat surprisingly, it was Kanami-san who apologised. In turn, Akane-san couldn't help but acknowledge that Kanami-san, too, was a prominent woman of respectable status. 
I was wrong too, she said, awkwardly, avoiding eye contact. They both hung their heads and stared at the floor, though the atmosphere was still distinctly awkward. At least the fiasco seemed to be over, until Maki-san ruined it completely. This is going to get worse before it gets better, she muttered with an icy voice and an audacious grin. Just what was this fortune teller chick trying to butt in with, now that things have finally settled down? Meanwhile, Iria sans were twinkling with excitement. Is that a prophecy? she asked. What do you mean? Is it going to get worse before it gets better? This is so fascinating. Will you tell us? I won't. I'm not saying anything. Nope. As she spoke, she cast a sideways glance in Kunigisa's direction. I'm not quite so arrogant as to get the rest of the world involved. What's that supposed to mean? I protested without thinking. As for Kunigisa, she had already turned her full attention back to nutritional intake. It was as though she really was nothing more than a simple annoyance to her. Maki-san, what do you mean by that? There's no meaning, just like there's no meaning in your actions. You know, you're... wow. You're the kind of guy who could get angry for the sake of a complete stranger, huh? That's not a very good thing. It's not bad, per se, but it's not good. Oh my, and why's that? Iria-san said, stepping into our conversation. Or rather, maybe I was the one in the sideline. I think it's wonderful to be able to get angry on the behalf of a stranger. That's not so common in the world nowadays. That's because the people who can expose their emotions for the sake of someone else are the same people who blame things on others when something goes wrong. I despise people like you. It had to be the first time in a while that someone had spoke to me so harshly right to my face. Slowly, she brought a glaring gaze to meet my eyes. You just let yourself get carried along by other people. You're the type of person who ignores traffic lights just because everyone else is doing it. You're an abominable excuse as a human being. They often say harmonize without agreeing. But in your case, young man, it's like you're agreeing without harmonizing. I won't say that that's bad. I won't say anything as to that. One's identity and one's worth are not always connected. A train that runs along the track is better than a train that doesn't. So I won't say anything as to that. But I hate people like you. I despise them. People like you always blame things on others, never acknowledging their own responsibility just carried along with the flow. To be sure, that's how I lived. However, I don't recall I hated it. Me and Kunigisa, I had grown thoroughly repulsed by it. I don't recall you telling me that, Humane Maki-san. Oh, are you angry? Gee, your boiling point is a lot lower than I expected. Are you the type that gets mood swings all the time? E, eat me. Go screw yourself. Go screw yourself. Go screw yourself. Go screw yourself. Go screw yourself, bitch! Ichan Tug. Kunigisa yanked on my sleeve. This isn't worth getting angry about. Kunigisa Tomo. I felt a chill go through my body. The power drained from my body. It was beyond weakness. Closer to extortion. I slumped in my chair. Sorry, I was just joking, okay? Makasan said to Kunigisa with a terribly sweet smile. And so dinner that day was a bit of a disaster. Of course, the two days prior hadn't exactly gone off without a hitch either, but the intelligence of this jack-of-all-trades seemed to have shattered something. This Aikawa-san's coming visit to the island was becoming something to dread. Granted, I wouldn't be there when it happened, so I didn't really have much to do with it. Nevertheless, I had no idea why Maki-san was digging into me so much. Certainly I hadn't made a great first impression on her, but that couldn't have been the only reason. At this point, it was obvious that she hated me, but that wasn't reason enough to be harping on me so aggressively like this. The opposite of affection is not animosity, but apathy. If she just didn't like me, she wouldn't go as far out as to pick on me like this. Why out of this entire group of brilliant people would Himane Maki specifically target a boring, ordinary person like me? We didn't have anything to do with each other. It was strange. Brooding over the subject in my mind, I didn't think for a moment about Maki-san's prophecy of worsening of things. If I had given it some thought, it's not likely that anything would have gone differently anyway. But looking back, I can't help but regret that a little. I guess there was nothing I could have done about it that though. I guess there was nothing that I could have done about that though. After all, only Maki-san could have regretted things before they happened. It was already past 10 o'clock when I borrowed Kunigisa's bath to freshen up. Kunigisa sat in front of the PCs in the revolving chair, but all three terminals were turned off. She just wanted to spin. She must have had a strong stomach. You take a bath too. No. I don't care about tonight, but take one tomorrow. No. Tomorrow I will strip you down, tie your hands and feet, and throw you in. If you don't want that, you'd better do it yourself. 
Oh, what a drag. She half rose out of her chair to stretch. I envy fish. They don't ever have to take baths. Hmm, but I wonder if they get cold in the winter. Oh, by the way, have you heard of this before, Echan? So, like, let's say that you're keeping fish in a fish tank, and you say that you gradually raise the temperature of the tank. Like, you raise it so gradually that the fish doesn't even notice. Eventually, the water gets so hot that it's boiling, but the fish's body's gotten used to the gradual change, so it can go on swimming without even noticing how hot the water is. It sounds like a lie, but it's real. Now, Echan, what lesson can we gather from this? That global warming isn't a problem? Ding, 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 ding! She looked utterly amused. What a peppy chick, I thought. Then, without warning, she completely collapsed. Face first, belly down, without breaking her fall. I flinched. Ow, that hurt. No doubt. What the hell are you doing? I'm hungry. You just ate a freaking feast. That doesn't matter. I missed breakfast and lunch, so I probably haven't eaten enough. I slept all afternoon, so don't have to sleep again until tomorrow. But I guess you really have to make sure you sleep and eat properly. Human bodies aren't made for that kind of treatment. I guess I'm not a human then. Let's go. Let's get something to eat, Echan. Will you tie my hair up first? I think Yoyoi san's probably already back in her room. She gets up early, so don't you think that she's already sleeping? We couldn't just go wake her up so she would make some dinner. We had to remember that she was a guest too. Hikari chan's probably awake though. Hikari chan's cooking is delicious too, in Hikari chan's kind of way. If Hikari chan's asleep too, Echan, you can make me something. Why me? Well, because you look so amusing from behind when you're cooking. <laughs> she laughed naughtily, still face down. Okay, 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 fine, fine. Understood, Miss Tomo. First, I'll tie your hair up, so get over here. Oh my, oh my, I tied her hair in a loose ponytail. Then we left her room, heading for the living room. Ah, uh, by the way, sorry about earlier. About what? Ah, about the thing with Maki-chan. Yeah, it's okay, I'll forgive you. But really, compared to the old days, you've gotten soft. I don't think you'd let her off with just a single comment like that. I wonder if living in Houston repressed you or something. Yeah, well, living in a desert like that for five years, your beliefs start to change. I'm not sure if it matters that it was a desert, though. You should tell me about it sometime. What happened over there and stuff? You've changed a lot, too. Not so much in outside, but on the inside. There's nothing in this world that doesn't change. It's Pontare. Handare? The cycling of all things, Ichan. You're supposed to be smart, so why don't you know anything? I've just got bad memory. All I want is an average one, really. Just enough of one that I wouldn't forget the fun times. Just enough of one so I could realise the world is full of good things, too. Ah! A Karachan spotted! Kunigisa said and charged down the hallway. I looked to see that. Indeed, a Karachan was there. Or really, at this distance, there was probably no way I could tell whether it was a Karachan or a Karachan. It was also possible that it was Terako-san with her glasses removed, but if Kunigisa said it was Akari-san, it was most likely her. By the time I reached them, Kunigisa and Akari had already exchanged a few words. Kunigisa returned to my side, and Akari continued down the hall in the opposite direction. I wondered about her. She must have had a lot of work left to do, even at this hour. If that was the case, she really was going above and beyond. What did you talk about? She says Akari-san's in the living room. Oh yeah? That's convenient. Of course, not everything in the world goes so smoothly. When we arrived in the living room, not only Hikari-san, but also Shinya-san and my arch-nemesis, Himane Maki-san, were there. The three of them sat in a horseshoe-shaped sofa, engaging in light-hearted discussion. On the table were some glasses and alcohol, plus some cheese and a big plate prepared as a snack. Hikari-san promptly noticed our presence and called out with a raised hand. Ah, Tomo-san! Having been spotted, there was nothing that we could do. We walked over to join them on the sofa. Awkwardly, Kunigisa quickly snapped the seat next to Hikari-san, forcing me to sit next to Maki-san. All the same, I couldn't bear the thought of turning tail and running now. It was dishonourable to flee in the face of the enemy. But Maki-san, seeming to see right through me, greeted me with a wicked expression. Welcome to my club, she said, boastfully. Sorry about before, I guess I hit a touchy subject. She apologised, insincerely. Really, I'm sorry. Anybody would get mad about such a sensitive subject. It wasn't a particularly sensitive subject. Oh, it was. It was so painful, she sneered at me. Might she have been drunk? No, she was like this all the time. In fact, she was probably more pleasant when drunk. She slugged down her wine in one gulp, then thrust her glass at me. Now you drink too, boy. Alcohol is good, you know. You forget all the bad things. There's nothing so bad that I want to forget. And there's nothing so good that you want to remember. 
She giggled. I don't think your poor memory is to blame for not having any happy memories. There are few happy things in life, and few sad things. There's not much of anything at all. It's all empty. It's emptiness scarier than darkness. <laughs> Isn't life fun? Retrocognition. Telepathy. It seemed the advertisements about her weren't just baloney. She was damn clairvoyant. Give me a break, Maki-san. This is just bullying. Yep, I'm bullying you. Now drink up. I don't do alcohol. I'm underaged. How by the book of you. Oh dear, you're being so cold. Oh, Ichan, you're so cool. Is that what you want to hear? That's weird. I should call you the boy who's cold even in summer. She put her glass in front of her with a bored expression on her face. Apparently quite starving, Kunagisa scarfed down the cheese appetizer. She ate with two hands, displaying terrible manners. Of course, knowing that it would cause no harm in this situation, it was hard to care about stuff like that. It's Supreme, Valencia, and Moroli cheese, Hikari-san explained sweetly. Apparently they were good cheeses to have with wine. Trying a single piece, I found that it was indeed delicious, but probably only Kunagisa would be able to stand a whole lot of it, without in so much as some water. How did it go with Kanami? Shinya-san asked after a while, cheese in hand. He seemed fairly interested. Did the modelling go well? Er, uh, I suppose. There were no problems, anyway. She's got a pretty foul personality, yeah? He spoke without enthusiasm. About his own boss, no less. Oh, no, she doesn't. Is that so? Well, at least I've never met a woman with a worse personality than that. I had. She was sitting right next to me, drinking up. No, she was fine, really. Oh, but she did smash one of her pictures all of a sudden. That was surprising. He smirked. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. When I got back to the hotel, she was all, Shinya-san, dispose of this garbage. I was like, who are you, Picasso? Sorry about that. That's just her thing. Don't pay any attention to it. That woman's seen quite a bit of success without exerting much effort. So she's very obstinate. She can't live without acting like a big shot. Her thing? Yeah, you know, if she acts like... Yeah, you know, if she acts like that, she looks like a world-class artist, don't you think? Didn't she say all sorts of artsy things to you? Sort of snooty things? That's how she is, you see. Well, but that's her true nature, right? I mean, I thought it was. Oh, of course. It's unquestionably her true nature. But she doesn't have to say that kind of stuff, now does she? If she were a real artist, she wouldn't talk like that. Kanami is a genius, to be sure. But she's miles away from being an artist. She's just giving herself an image. At least, that's what I think. I'd appreciate if she would peel away that facade. But you know how it is. He looked a little sad. Seriously, he continued, taking a sip of wine. He had wandered slightly off topic. The glass of wine suited him very well. It was a little enviable. That's the reason I asked you to be a model too. She doesn't do many portraits, you see. Oh yeah? But she was saying that she doesn't choose her subjects. Well, she doesn't, but it's a taste issue. She hates people. No matter how she draws them, they complain, you see. Plus, you know, because she used to be blind, and now her legs are bad. And above all else, she's got that kind of personality. She doesn't get along well with anyone. That's how geniuses are. The only genius I'd ever heard of who was good with human relationship was Geis. People like Michelangelo were supposedly wildly disliked. But with Michelangelo, it was because he didn't like anybody to begin with. You don't have to be a genius to be socially awkward, Maki-san interjected with a phony, innocent expression. Ah, indeed. That woman has a lot of pride about having reached where she is on her own. So it's no wonder that she doesn't get along with Sonyama-san. Indeed, Akane-san, who had honed her talents to the group atmosphere in ER3 system, and Kanami-san, who was a raging individualist, were particularly polar opposites. It was only natural that they never hit it off. It was I who taught art to Kanami-san, Shinya-san said. Her eyes got better, and you have to understand, back then she had nothing. No family, no special knowledge to speak of, so I gave her a brush. It was only to try and comfort her, but just a month later, she had surpassed me. So you're an artist too? I hadn't heard that. He shrugged his right shoulder, a little embarrassed. After Konami-san surpassed me, I quit. When Verocha realised that Da Vinci had surpassed him, he broke his own paintbrush. I, too, grow to understand his feelings in that moment. With this person of unbelievable talent right next to me all the time, there was no need for me to paint pictures. That morning, Shinya-san had told me that we were alike. I didn't know what he meant until now. The Saki Shinya relative to Ibuki Kanami. It was just like me relative to Kunagi Satomo. Though he spoke badly of her, it was clear to me now that Shinya-san had unconditional affection for Kanami-san. So you're the kind of guy who does everything for other people too, eh, Shinya-san? Maki-san said, as if reading my mind. What an analogy. 
Of course, in Shinya-san's case, there's a charm to it, unlike with some people. And what's that? He doesn't go around blaming others. She was going to bring me down blow by blow. Hmm, hey, hey, Hikari-san interjected with a worried look. Who wants something to drink? Some kind of soda would be good. Certainly, right away. She pulled a small bottle of ginger ale out of the living room fridge and quickly returned. With a bright smile, she placed it beside me. Please enjoy. She really was quite a hard worker. I thought it would be rude to keep fighting like this in front of her, so I forced my wound-up nerds to relax. God, there I go, blaming it on others. Damn, Maki-san had me in the palm of her hand. Hikari-chan, give me a drink too, Kunigisa said. Certainly. She went over to Kunigisa with a ginger ale. Come to think of it, you're underage as well. Isn't that right, Kunigisa-chan? Maki-san said. But it's okay, isn't it? How about it? Just one drink. Please don't encourage her. My, my, playing guardian, are we? Maki-san sneered. Ah, how wonderful it must be to be young. But you're still young as well. No, I'm already 29. She spoke as if it was no big deal. But I was a little surprised. She was already dressed like such a kid. I figured that she'd be about the same age as Iria-san. Wow, so that means you're the same age as Kanami, Shinya-san said. Then Himane-san, you are still young. You know, I'm already 32 years old. Once you pass 30, you really start to feel your age. You get winded easily and such. Hikari-san, how old are you? I took my chance to ask. I'm 27. So then, Hikari-san is 27 too. Yep, we're triplets after all. 27. I repeated the number a few times in my head. 27 years old. Hikari-san and Hikari-san both 27. Maybe it was rude of me, but they really didn't look 27. I almost wondered if there was some sort of age-stopping mystery air flowing through the island. Nah, not likely. This wasn't Neverland. Akane-chan is 30, right? And I think Yoyo-chan's about 30 as well. Boy, when you sit down and think about it, everyone sure is young. Iryo-chan must really like young female geniuses. Pretty lousy hobby, if you ask me. Kunigisa nodded in agreement as she crammed her face with cheese. Apparently, having picked up a spicy piece, she immediately went for the ginger ale and chugged it. But it looked as if it went down the wrong pipe, and she released a barrage of coughs. What the hell was she doing? Shinya-san let out a sigh. I thought if I brought Kanami here to cohabitate with other people, she might change a little. Kind of like when you send a kid off to camp. But this strategy seems to be off the mark. It's kind of like a last resort. At this point, she'll probably be living like that for the rest of her life. Misunderstood by everyone. Not expecting anyone to understand. Not relying on anyone but herself. Eating away at herself all the while. Well, that's one way to live. Look who's talking. I don't think I even have to mention whose lie that was. Speaking of which, Maki-san, why are you here on this island? Shinya-san said. I've been wondering for a while. It's not just a vacation, is it? It is. This place is a sweet deal. You get to live for free, and you even get money for it. It's Zenadu. If I use the net, I can even still do fortune-telling. It's a world of convenience. Non-stop good times. What a crappy excuse for an adult. I'm pretty damn crappy at that. I don't recall hearing your story, Maki-san said, breaking my silence. Why are you on this island, then? And please don't tell me it's something like you came here because Kunigisa-chan said that she was going. Don't act like you know me, bitch. Seriously, why was she picking on me like that? Maybe she really was just making fun of me, with no objective reason whatsoever. It was unthinkable. Wrong, she said, and then looked over at Kunigisa. Fine, assuming guys like you don't matter anyway, why is Kunigisa-chan here? Just a whim. Just a whim. I don't like making reasons for every little thing I do. I wonder. Maki-san gave a suspicious grin. I didn't know what the deal with her personality was, but she seemed to be getting along with everyone besides me rather well, including Kunigisa. She's clever, unlike you. Ah? Getting sick of this? Getting tense? <laughs> but I won't stop. I'm going to keep playing with you until I'm bored of it. She wore an absolutely sadistic smile. I felt like a ca- I felt like captured game. Telepathy, eh? Amazing as usual, Himane-san. But lay off him, Shinya-san cut in. You've chased a whole lot of brilliant people off this island doing that. He'll be leaving soon enough as it is, so there's no need to send him home any faster, right? Everyone I try and have fun with hates me. It's discrimination against people with superpowers, I tell you. Superpowers. They talked about it like an everyday thing. But did such a thing really exist? As a comprehensive research centre, they had even conducted advanced psychological research related to super abilities. Psychokinesis, ESP, DOP, levitation and teleportation. I'd seen a number of papers on the inexplicable, unobservable subject in the time of the ER3 program, and even met a person who claimed it was for real, though he was a phony. 
But all I concluded was that no matter how you thought about it, that stuff was a bunch of bull. None of those papers really explained anything, despite how hard they tried to arbitrarily cram the facts into conclusions. It was like they were called dry love. The dry love filled thesis paper of these phony scientists were, to be fair, amusing in their own right. But that's all they were. They certainly didn't have what it took to convince someone of anything. That's just because they have a narrow mind. Have you ever heard of the word privacy? It's not my fault. I see what I see. I hear what I hear. And by the way, trying to run away is futile. No matter where you go, I'll know exactly where you are. So you have remote viewing and super sensitive hearing powers too? Kunigisa said. I know a lot of people with special powers, but this is the first time I've ever met someone with so many. Multi, multi, amazing. Despite knowing our past, futures and minds, we're all possibly being read right now. Kunigisa was without a care in the world. Or maybe she didn't have any secrets to keep. I really wanted psychokinesis, actually, but I ended up gravitating towards ESP for the same reason. Too bad. Doesn't teleportation seem so convenient? Psychokinesis, referred to as PK, and ESP were academically defined as two completely different abilities. In the mainstream metapsychology, it's often said that the existence of ESP can now be proven. It's often said that the existence of ESP can now be proven, though the same cannot be said about PK. This is because the idea of PK is something completely inhuman while ESP is simply an extension of actual human senses. Fortune telling is about all I can do with just ESP. It's not such a useful ability, Maki-san said with a sigh. Certainly there wasn't much that she could have done apart from fortune telling, but I still felt sceptical about the whole idea. Maki-san, can you prove that you have these special powers? I don't think I need to. How would you, for example, prove that you are? Would you show your driver's license? Would you be convinced if I had a superpowers license? It doesn't matter anywhere. Whether or not you think it's true or you think it's a lie, or think it's something else, it doesn't affect anything anyway. Just like me knowing everything doesn't change anything. Hmm. I wonder. You sure have a lot of doubt. Ah, okay. How about I give you your fortune again? She said out of the blue, grinning at me. Damn, I hadn't seen this coming. You deceived me the first time after all. Yeah, let's do it. It's a good opportunity for you. I almost never do fortune tellings for free. I'll pass. Quick answer. You really hate me, huh? <laughs> My mentor always taught me to push people's hatred onward, so that's what I want to do. I can't help but wonder if your mentor meant something else. You're quite a liar, aren't you? She began her fortune telling regardless of what I had said. You don't like showing your emotions, but you don't like controlling them either. So you have many regrets. Even though you let yourself get pushed around by other people's opinions, you're quite independent. When faced with a challenge, you run away without deliberating. But you're not dumb. And you don't like competition. Sound about right? Is that what people call cold reading? I shot back. You could have just said anything. Those are all things that hold true for any person, to some extent. Is that so? Hmm, maybe. Then let's talk about your relationship with kunigisa Jam. What we call compatibility reading. Hmm. Both you and kunigisa Chan are the type who don't need friends. Yet for some reason you stick together. And the reason for that is... Oh my. This part is fairly skewed. You stay by her side because you're jealous of her. And while you're jealous of her ability to express herself freely, she somehow looks unhappy, regardless of whether or not she really is. You see this girl, who has everything that you want, and can do all the things that you can't do, yet she is still, for some reason, unhappy. And that makes you feel better. That makes you feel like it doesn't matter if you can't get what you want. Really? Kunigisa gave me a confused look. Whether or not it was true or not, it wasn't okay to say such a thing right in front of Kunigisa. I shut my head. No, Maki-san. I think you've got me all wrong. I'm not such a complicated guy. I'm simple as can be. Well, well, maybe, maybe not. Say, Maki-chan, Kunigisa said, moving closer to her. If that's really the case, then why do I spend all my time with Ichan? Sorry, but I can't seem to read your mind, or past, Maki-san gave a shrug. Occasionally I meet someone like that. I guess it's a compatibility issue or something, but the aura surrounding them is very ambiguous and hard to decipher. It's like they're in the dark, and it's a little unsettling. It puts me in a bad mood. So maybe she was just venting on me. How awful. Himene-san, in light of the occasion, I'll go ahead and ask a question too. How does it feel to be able to see the future and read people's minds as such? Shinya-san said. I'm just curious. It's like asking how things look to spiders with eight eyes. To attempt to simply explain... To attempt a simple explanation. It's like watching TV. It's like the entire room is covered with TVs. And I don't have a remote. I can't turn them off, and I can't change the channels, so all I can do is watch. It's like having a few more brains than regular people, if you can imagine that. I couldn't. 
Now, what's his face over there got us a little off topic. Kunigisa chan, but I still but I still haven't heard why you came to the island. It was just on a whim, I tell you. No, I may not be able to read you, but I know that that's not why. Kunigisa wheezed out a strange sigh. She seemed a little troubled. I wasn't a big fan of Maki-san's way of posing questions. But to be honest, I had been wondering about that myself. For what reason had Kunigisa, the ultimate shutting with no equal, been compelled to travel all the way out here to Wet Crow's Feather Island? Okay, I'll tell you, she finally said with a piece of cheese in her tongue. I'm interested in the incident that took place here a long time ago. But I didn't get the chance to learn anymore. Just as I was about to ask, what do you mean, incident? I bit down on my tongue. Hard. Thus, I was unable to get the words out. But even if I miraculously had somehow, I never would have reached Kunigisa's ears, nor anyone else's ears, including my own. It would have been drowned out by the other noise. The shaking. I soon realised it was an earthquake. Gah! Shinya-san's uttered. Everyone, please stay calm, urged Hikari-san whose profession demanded that she remained cool no matter what happened. Maki-san, who looked as if she'd been expecting an earthquake all along, reclined on the couch with a glint of worry. I tried to recall what I had learned about earthquakes back in the first year of junior high school, when I was still in Japan. Supposedly, they start with small tremors, and then they get bigger and bigger. I couldn't quite recall which were F's waves and which were P waves, or figure out which were horizontal and which were vertical tremors, but that didn't matter. At any rate, the strength of the shaking had jumped a few levels, in a panic, I shoved Kunigisa, whose expression said, I have no idea what's going on, onto the sofa, and threw myself on top of her. There was a chandelier right above her. If it were to fall, she wouldn't stand a chance of survival with that tiny stature of hers. That was my thinking at the time, anyway. But my efforts seemed to have been in vain, because not a moment later, the shaking died down. Of course, when I say not a moment later, I mean in terms of real time. To me, it felt only slightly less dragging and terrible than five minutes with your hand on the stove. In reality, the shaking had probably lasted for less than 10 seconds. Is it over? I asked, still on top of Kunigisa. Yeah, Maki-san answered. It was the word of a prophet, and probably trustworthy. Meanwhile, Kunigisa groaned with her face buried in the sofa, so I got off her for the time being. An earthquake? It was pretty big too. I wonder what it rated on the scale, Shinya-san said, looking around the room. The glasses and bottles on the table had fallen, and Hikari-san had already reflexively begun to clean. Pardon me, Hikari-san. I'm going to borrow the phone. I'm worried about Konami. He pointed at the house phone. Hikari-san nodded. He headed to the white phone by the cabinet. Hikari-san, do you have a radio or something? I said. I want to check the earthquake level. Oh, Toma, could you look it up on the internet? Well, there's probably already been breaking news bulletin. We're technically in Kyoto right now, right? Oh, wait, is that wrong? It was a level 3 or 4. I can't quite pinpoint the epicenter, but it was probably around Maizuru where the level would be at a 5, Maki-san said quite matter-of-factly, and it seemed like there weren't many injuries, even in urban areas. How do you know? Perhaps it was inelegant of me to pose such a question, but it also just felt like the natural thing to say. She let out a big sigh before answering. It's like I've been telling you. I just know. You may be smart, but you sure are slow. Don't have much memory either, it would seem. Hey, wait, doesn't that make you stupid? Anyway, to use an expression, I can see these things clear as day. Ibuki and the others are all fine. Ah, remote viewing and super hearing, was it? Distance wasn't a factor for her. She could technically watch TV somewhere on the other side of the ocean and even predict what would appear next. Complex ESP. Even if she had been making all of this up, there was no way to check. But it was probably true that the mansion hadn't suffered much damage. Shinya-san returned from the phone. Konami's fine, he said. She says that she's at the Alti Lair. Some paint cans have fallen off the shelf. It sounds like a big hassle, but at least she's not hurt. Should you go over there? He was a caretaker after all, and even if he hadn't been, he must have been worried about her, seeing as she couldn't walk. Nah, no need, he said with a shrug. She'll probably get ticked off if I did. Why do you say that? Because she told me not to come, he said with a pained expression of humility. She says that she's working right now. In fact, she's working on your portrait. Sounds like she's going to turn it into a real masterpiece so I'd better not bother her. Even with Ibuki-san's talent, there's no hope if she uses such a terrible model, Maki-san said. You really hate me, don't you? Uh-huh, she nodded. Jeez. Well, whatever. That's how life has always gone for me anyway. 
I looked over at Hikari-san. Does this happen here a lot? Earthquakes, I mean. Not a lot, really. Shinya-san, you've been through a few, right? Yes, but this one's unusually big. I wonder if any furniture fell over. I'm a little worried. If you're going to fix things up, I'll help. Tomorrow we'll deal with it depending on Rei-san's orders. She flashed a sweet smile. If she were a mother, her kids would grow up proper for sure. If we hadn't met in this kind of place under these kinds of circumstances, I definitely would have fallen for her. Or at least I thought I would. It was never going to happen, but I thought so. <laughs> this is my first earthquake in a while, Kunigisa mumbled, tossing her blue hair around as she finally got up from the sofa. I wonder if my computers are alright. They should be if the epicenter was in Maizuru. The mansion should be okay too. Boy, this takes me back to the great Hanshin quake. Say, Ichan, you were already in Houston in those days, right? Yep, for sure. I vaguely remember seeing something about it in the news back in my tiny room in America. That was a really tough time for me. I was still in Kobe back then. Most of my computers crashed permanently. I was so startled. Was startled really the most appropriate word to describe living through a disaster? So shouldn't you be worried about your computers? You must be fully crowned with cheese by now. Let's go back to your room already. It seemed like the time was right, so I decided to leave the living room. I didn't trust that I had the self-control to stay cool if I had to talk to Maki-san anymore. It seemed like a good time to split. As if to be able to read my every thought, Maki-san's gaze burned a hole through my back. It took every ounce of willpower in my body to ignore her. I pulled Kunigisa by the arm and took her back to her room. The three PCs, I mean two PCs and one workstation, in a room remained securely situated on the computer rack, and the room had suffered no other damage. Kunigisa let out a big yawn and stretched. Let's turn in already. Having a full stomach really makes you sleepy, huh? Ichan, undo my hair. Do it yourself, will you? Come on, it's hard to undo a ponytail by myself. I'm not flexible. It's not that I can't do it, but I'll start aching. I've broken bones that way, you know. I get it, I get it. You're really adorable, you know that? I removed the band from her hair and ran the comb through it. She let out a naughty little giggle. Once I was finished, she dove into bed. She sunk herself into the mattress and rolled around joyously. Take off your coat. How many times do I have to tell you? And aren't you hot? This coat has special memories attached to it, so no dice. Kunigis has passed. Maybe it had something to do with that team. Anyway, Ichan, Kanami-chan and Akane-chan are pretty terrible, but you and Maki-chan don't seem to be on the best terms either. Well, it's more like she harasses me for no reason, I said, thinking about how similar this was to what Kanami-san had said. I don't have any problems with her in particular. Yeah, I'll bet. You're not aggressive enough to hate or resent people. At the very worst, you get miffed. Isn't that right? You think? That's interesting. Just joking, she snickered. But Ichan, you really never fall in love with someone before, have you? Nope. I love that about you. Snicker, snicker. Strange. She was being weirdly feisty. I wondered if maybe the ginger ale had really been wine. I'd never seen her drunk before, so I couldn't imagine what she would be like. By the way, Tomo. Vet easy. Do you have any special powers? Hmm. If I did, I wouldn't mind at all, she said with a big grin. I don't really want any, but one can always dream. It's better for Santa Claus to exist for them for him not to write. It's just like that. That's an odd point of view. Even if she had special powers, she wouldn't mind. Hmm. Indeed, that was surprisingly insightful. Whether you had such abilities or not, it wouldn't have much effect on your daily life. Of course, now was a bit of an exception. Because we're on this island? Because we're on this island. I'm going to go back to my room to turn in too. See you tomorrow. If you're planning on sleeping now, I'll come and wake you tomorrow, so let's have breakfast together. Hey, Ichan, she called to me, still lying face up on her bed. Let's fool around, she beckoned me. I paused just for a second. No, I said. Weirdo, good for nothing, coward, chicken pot pie. Yeah, yeah, I shut the door, went downstairs and headed to my room. It would have been truly awful to run into Maki-san in the hallway or something, but luckily no such incident occurred. Perhaps she was still busy chatting with Shinya-san. I found a key sticking out of the door of my room. Maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise, seeing I was supposed to be a storage room, but I couldn't help but wonder about being trapped inside. If someone were to turn the key while I was asleep, there was no way I could reach the window, even if I stood on a chair, so it would be like solitary confinement. Then again, there was nothing anyone could gain by locking me up, so it was probably an excessive worry. I entered the room and curled up my futon, and stared at the ceiling and thought. I was of course thinking about what Mikey san had said earlier. Oh, bye. This part is fairly skewed. You stay by her side because you're jealous of her. And while you're jealous of her ability to express herself freely, she somehow looks unhappy, regardless of whether or not she really is. You see this girl, 
who has everything that you want and can do all the things that you can't do, yet she is still, for some reason, unhappy. And that makes you feel better. That makes you feel like it doesn't matter if you can't get what you want. <laughs> Damn it. She's exactly right. I can understand the seven fools who described Kunigisa and I as a codependent pair, but really, Maki-san's opinion was closer. To me, Kunigisa Toma represented everything I most wanted to be. No, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. To me, she was... She was... She was what? The reason I chose a university in Kyoto rather than Kobe was because she had moved to Kyoto. I also couldn't deny that she was one of the reasons I left Houston. Why had I done all that? As Maki-san had said, I wasn't aggressive enough to have feelings like love or hate. Even if someone were to bother me, it was a feeling no different than being annoyed when it rains. No matter how much disdain Maki-san had for me, no matter how many malicious comments Kanemi-san spit at me, no immersion would ever build up inside me. I couldn't help but wonder, was I really human? I didn't understand other people's feelings at all. If they really existed, if superpowers like the ones Maki-san had claimed really existed, perhaps I wanted some myself. Nah, I don't need that. I reconsidered. If I could really understand people's feelings, it would just make life all the more annoying. I wasn't looking for a life with an open Pandora's box. I didn't have the nerve for it. I'm just babbling nonsense here. Damn it. I hate vacation. I just ended up thinking too much. Well, I don't know if it's really too much, but there are kinds of thoughts that only lead to one's downfall. Four more days. I could be patient. I didn't hate being patient. Or at least, I was used to it. Suffering and pain. I was used to these things. Still, they don't feel too good. Damn. I wanted to return to my peaceful life on the other side of the sea. I thought, as I fell into the night. But the following day I would realise that these past three days had been plenty peaceful. <laughs>